acceptable sacrifice of praise. To magnify, according to the Bible, you know, as we read here, I will praise the name of God with a song. And then he says, the psalmist says, I will magnify him with thanksgiving. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. I've always thought about that word when we use it uh, in our context to magnify because to magnify means to make greater in actual size. It means to increase the apparent size of, it means to enlarge, uh, it means to blow up, to aggrandize, to, uh, to amplify, if you will. And it's always intriguing to me that the Bible commands us to magnify the Lord. It's intriguing to me because how can you make a God who is already all powerful, all great, all, all knowing, all sufficient? How can we elevate a God? How can we aggrandize? How can we enlarge that God who knows every single word before it is spoken? How can you make that God any bigger? You know, to magnify God. How can we elevate a God for whom the psalmist said the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool? How can you make a God bigger? The same God that the Bible said, the heavens of the heavens cannot contain him. You know, you can't, you, I, 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 that, that's just, the, you know, you can't, you can't make that God bigger. How can you make a God bigger? The Bible said that the world is upheld by the word of his power, by the power of his word. The Bible also talks about that the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, the Bible also says that he measures the sea with the palm of his hand. You know, that, that's a bad God when he can measure the sea with the palm of his hand. And yet, the Bible commands us to magnify our God. How can you make this God bigger? This is the God who claims that there is no God on earth besides him. And to prove it, he is not called Lord. He's called Lord of Lords. He is called King of Kings. You know, he's not just King. He's King of Kings. He, he, there is none beside me. Whom hath been his counselor? Amen. And so you can't aggrandize this God. How can you magnify this God? How can we make this God greater than what he is? When we consider our own lowly estate, like the psalmist also did, uh, then we can only exclaim like the psalmist did, when I consider thy heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast created, he said, I have to ask myself in view of all of this magic that you have created, then I've, I've got to ask myself, what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of men that you would visit him? He said, what am I that I would even be able to enlarge you, magnify you, make you bigger? I can't do that. You are all big. You are all powerful. You are all, no, you are omniscient. You are omnipresent. You are omnipotent. These things make you God. I cannot even dare to even think or assume and presume that I can enlarge you. However, over and over again in the scripture, the Bible invites us to magnify the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And he doesn't stop there. Let us exalt his name together. 
<laughs> you know, how do you do that? Well, uh, uh, we can't make God any bigger. We can't make him any stronger. We can't elevate him in rank and in honor, in position, in power, in character, in knowledge, in quality. We can't do any of these things. So there must be a way that we can magnify God without changing who he is. So to better understand what the psalmist is inviting us to do, it's best to distinguish the two ways in which you can magnify something. See, number one, the way that you magnify something is to make something appear larger than what it presently is. That is through a microscope, you know. If you've ever taken a, a science class of some sort, you know that a microscope enlarges the actual size of a micro being or micro element so that we can study it and, and we can study its most minuscule element and we can see it through that microscope. And what that microscope is doing, it is enlarging the image so that we can see it bigger than what it actually is. But there's a second way that you can magnify something. And the second way to magnify something is to make something that appears to be small in our sight to be magnified so that we can see it in its actual size. And the way that we do that is not through a microscope, but through a telescope. Let me explain. A telescope does not magnify a planet. All right. A telescope does not make the sun any bigger than what it already is. When you look at the planet, you look at the star, the sun, there is a million planet Earths. If the sun was hollow today, in, in that star, or, there is a million planet Earths that can live inside of the sun today. That's how small we are. That's how big the sun is. So, baby, you are not magnifying the sun when you're looking at it through the telescope. You are not magnifying a planet when you are looking at it through the telescope. What you are doing is you are making something that is already all big all you know it's already in its actual size what you are doing is you are trying to see it in its actual size you are magnifying not the planet not the star itself you are magnifying your sight of that planet all right. And so in our sight, the sun can be so small from our perspective that in the right angle, at the right angle, you can block it with your thumb. That's how small it can be. However, it's not the sun that is small. It, it is our perspective of the sun that is small and minuscule. And so we magnify the sun as we adjust the telescope so that our perspective of that sun can be aggrandized and enlarged and so it can be magnified and exalted and when the psalmist asks us to magnify our God he is asking us to see God through a telescope and not through a microscope what he is saying is in other words to magnify God it means to make him as large as he already is that you have not yet seen him. He's saying magnify God. Adjust your lens so that you can see him as he already is. You're not making him any greater, but what it is is all of a sudden you're getting a whiff that God is great, that God is mighty, that God is powerful, that God and now whenever you see his glory through the adjusted lens, you you're saying, my God, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. I had not even, I had not even imagined that you could be that big. And now I've got to sing with the rest of the world. How great is our God? You are 
are great. You are great. You are awesome. You are mighty. You are. This is who you already are. This is what you are. You are being revealed. I'm changing my perspective. My perspective is being magnified. God, when you magnify God, it is not a praise that wishes to change his size. You cannot change the size of a man who measures the sea with the palm of his hand, but it is a confession. It is a confession that my view of you is much too small. My perspective of you is much too minuscule. When I magnify God, when I exalt God, when I make him great, and greatly to be praised. What I'm doing is I am switching and I am adjusting my spiritual telescope. What I'm saying is let me adjust my perspective. You are great. You are good. You are powerful. You are merciful. My view of you needs to be adjusted. My view of you, my perspective of you, it needs to be adjusted. That's what praise is. Praise, praise puts things in perspective. When you praise, what you're saying is, oh God, I just discovered that you are a mighty and a merciful God. I just discovered that you are an awesome God. I just discovered that you are a healer. I just discovered... I discover it every day and that's why we praise we praise not to make him bigger but to adjust our perspective of his greatness and his might and his power and there is a key reason you know I, I, I love this because uh, when the psalmist asks us to magnify God that's what we're doing. How do we magnify God? Well, our, our text tells us magnify God, but it tells us how we do it. I will praise the name of God with a song. And watch this. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. How do you magnify God? You magnify God with thanksgiving. You magnify him with praise, but not just any praise, not just any praise. It is a praise that is full of thanksgiving. See, not all praise magnifies God. Not all praise magnifies God. The praise of thanksgiving magnifies God. There is a praise that God actually hates. You know, in the book of Amos, he said, I hate your feast days. He said, I despise your solemn assemblies. He said, I will not smell in your solemn assemblies and I will not hear the melody of your vials, of your instruments. I won't even hear the melody of your vials. He said, I hate them. I despise them. He was living in a time where his contemporaries, the prophets were saying, these people draweth nigh unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far removed from me. You know, and this is this is the context where Amos, this is the setting in which Amos is preaching to his people. He's saying, take away the feast days and all that other stuff. Oh, I don't even want to smell in your solemn assemblies. I don't want to hear your song. I don't want your praise. I've got angels, baby. I've got I've got holy angelic beings. If, if all I needed was praise and singing, I've got I've got angels that can sing. In a perfect pitch all the time and not lose sight of key. I've got angels that can do. I've got angels that are up there going, holy, 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 holy. I don't need your voice. I don't care what kind of runs you've got. I don't care what kind of melody you've got. I don't care how well you play. I don't care how well you sing. I don't care. I, I, if I need it, if that's what I needed, I could create beings to give me all of that and some more and there would be a whole lot more perfect than whatever you could ever offer me I don't need those things to be magnified 
So why does Thanksgiving magnify God? Why does Thanksgiving magnify God? Well, if you've ever been mad at somebody, if you've ever had a sibling, you know that uh, there's going to be some times, you know, that, that that's going to cause some, uh, some, some wars of sorts. When you are mad at your sister, in my case, when I would be mad at my sister for whatever reason, you crossed the line. You, you came into my room. This is the boy's room. You're not allowed in the man cave. And when, when they would trespass to steal my Snickers, And then I remember back in the day, we would, uh, my dad had a, a big old blue station wagon and we would have eight tracks in the station wagon and, uh, and, and they would make us sing together and they would make us, you know, uh, uh, we would, we would have to mind our manners with each other. But I remember that when I was mad at my sister and my dad would you know, I, I would hate when I was mad at my sister when she would do something for me. Something nice. Because then it meant that I had to say thank you. I, I hated that. I hated when dad, when my mom or my dad would look at me and say, what do you say? And then I turn to her and go, oh, thank you. I would mumble. I, I, I couldn't even get the words out. Do, do you know why I could not say thank you to someone I was offended by? You know why? Because gratitude is a compliment. It is an action that magnifies another person above yourself because it is an admission that they are the benefactor and that you are the beneficiary of their benefit. It is an admission that they are the giver and you are the recipient. It is an admission, thank you, implies that I am in your debt for something that you sacrificed your time, your money, or your effort for. And the glory of a gift does not belong to the receiver. The glory of a gift belongs to the giver. So, you know, you, you don't get a brand new car and people go over at you and say, Woo, boy, you bad. Look at you. No, if you say this was a gift, people are not magnifying you for the gift. They want to know who in the world, what kind of gracious man or woman, you know, gave you that, or what kind of what kind of drug dealer gave you that? You're not you're not trying to find out who the recipient is. You want to know who the giver is, because the glory of the gift belongs not to those who receive the gift, but to those who give the gift. There, there is a key reason why we don't like to say thank you. We don't like to say thank you when we're mad at somebody. Because what we are admitting when we say thank you is that I have something I did not have because of you. You gave me something. You did something to me. I am in your debt now because you provided something that I could not provide for myself. I am the recipient. I am the beneficiary. You are the benefactor. It magnifies you. It exalts you. 
It makes you great. I don't get the glory. I didn't have a part to play in this. It was your grace that has blessed me. It was you that worked, not my works. It was your work that got me what I have. I'm here because of you. I've got something because of you. It was your effort, your sacrifice, your work, your money, something you did that has caused me to now respond with thanksgiving. There's a key reason why we don't like to say thank you because it makes us weak. It makes us weak because we hate to be in anybody's debt. <laughs> because we are admitting we are admitting that the glory isn't ours but it is yours and that frustrates us. We have a hard time. Let me just say this. We have a hard time accepting gifts. We have a hard time accepting compliments. We have a hard time accepting favors. Do you know why? It's pride. It really is. I know most of us try to mask it by way of humility. Oh, I don't deserve that. Oh, you are not paying for me. You know, deep down inside, you're like, man, could you please pay for me and my kids? <laughs> you know, deep down and deep down inside, but you're out there, you know, and you're putting the front up like, no, no, bless God. I want to bless you, brother. I, I want to bless you. You ain't got nothing to bless with. What, what it is, is we don't like receiving because then I am in your debt. And so Israel thought, you know, they were happy at first when God instituted feast days and solemn assemblies and sacrifices because they thought, oh, great. Well, now we get to give to God. You know? uh, Israel thought they were doing God a favor by offering something to him. And so they enjoyed being elaborate with their praises and their gifts and so forth. And the reason they did all these things is because they were thinking the more bulls and goats and ox and the, the, the more perfect, the more this, the more that, then what we're doing is we are giving to God. We are no longer in his debt. Now he is in our debt. If we give to him, he has to heal us. If we give to him, he has to make us a powerful nation. If we give to him, he has to bless our families. If we give to him, he now is in our debt. And you know what the Lord responded with? He said, I will send a curse over you that will chase you, that will approach Approach you, it will reach you not only to you but to your descendants until you be destroyed. Because when you sacrificed and done to me, you didn't do it with joyfulness of heart for all the things that I have done. But don't we do the same today? We do the same exact thing. And listen, I'm going to include my, I'm going to be really honest with you. I've got to include myself in that number because I've done it a lot, you know, a while back, you know, before I read the Bible, I used to preach. I had never read the Bible. And uh, before, <laughs> I, I, I can't lie to y'all, but um, before I read the Bible, I uh, I used to preach. And the way I would preach was like, you know, praise him for, and then whatever, you know, we're praising him for. Praise him out of your, you know, if you praise him, God will do such and such. If you praise him, God will provide. If you praise him, God will do this. And I didn't realize that's not only not true and dishonorable, that's sacrilege. You know what we just did? We just reduced God to Baal. That's what the prophets of Baal did. 
If we cut ourselves, then our God will respond. If we, then God will do such and such. If we, and so all we do, you know, you see people, you see people and you're going, man, they have no idea what they're even praising for. It's religion. There are some people out there going crazy and stuff, and you're looking at them, and I just, I just got to praise, you know, God, God desires this, God wants this, and you're going, oh, hold up, this is the God that has angels round about the throne, you know, in angelic voices, do you really think that he needs you to run the aisles? Do you really think that when you now, now, Bishop, I'm gonna fix this. But do, <laughs> do do you really think that God needs you? Do you not that that's what Paul told the church in Athens, that or the, the unbelievers in Athens? He said, The God that made the heaven and the earth does not dwell in temples made by by man's hands, neither is he worshiped. One version says served, another version says worship, the same exact thing, worship and service. But he said, neither is he worshiped by man's hands as though he needed anything. That's what he said. He said, God doesn't need your sacrifice. That's what he was saying. God doesn't need your worship. God doesn't need, you can't put God in your debt. I'm going to say something that may sound a little, uh, it, it just may sound uh, a little controversial, but it, it boils my blood when I hear people, I've heard people, I've, I've been to too many places, and I've heard people say stuff like, well, you know, you got to go to God and say, well, God, you know, now I, I fulfilled my covenant, now you fulfill yours. That is sacrilege. You really want God to take out the list? Just because you fulfilled the law in one point? Well, God, I've been faithful with my tithe. And God is saying, but you haven't been faithful with your sex life. And let me give you, let me give you a thousand more things that I can come against you and say you haven't been faithful in such and such and such and such. You are a liar and a cheater and an adulterer and a fornicator and you've got pride and he can come down the line on you and say you did not fulfill your promise. There is none righteous. You can't put me in your debt, baby. Well, God, if you bring me out of this one, then I'm going to serve you. And so God is up there going, Woo! Finally, you're going to serve me now. I can finally go to bed in peace. You can't put God in your debt. It's what Israel thought. It's what we do today. We praise, and through that, we assume that we have placed God in our debt. And that's religion. It is not honoring. It is sacrilegious. And you know what our, our text says? It says, I will praise the name of God with song. Praises are not wrong. They are commanded. They are, that the people have invited you to do so. I'm going to tell you, that's why you will have a hard time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. You will have a hard time looking in the scripture where God demanded praise. It is not God who demands praise in the Bible. It is people who invite you. Let us praise the Lord together. Let us. God, you won't find God going over. Please give me praise. Your God is honored by praise and adulation and adoration. He is not that weak. Yeah. 
people invite you and rightfully so people invite you as a community of worship come into his gates with thanksgiving come with me into his courts with praise be thankful unto him it's people inviting you to come and praise him god is not asking for your praise because he doesn't need your praise uh. What is our text? That I'll praise the name of God with a song. And then he says, I will magnify him with thanksgiving. That is when I praise him, I'm going to be praising with a heart of gratitude. Not for, you know, I'm praising him, putting him in my debt so that he could give me something. I'm praising him because of everything he has already done for me. Don't you get it? If God didn't do one more thing for you, he's already done more than enough. He's already done way more than you ever deserve. And my question is now, how, how can a costly animal, animals, which were the principal, you know, way of barter in that day, they didn't use uh, paper money, but they used animals and, and so forth to barter and, and, and so forth. How can that, which was so costly to these families, how can an animal with horns and hoofs, and, and what he is saying here is, that's, what that, that's the point of bringing up the horns and all that. He was saying costly animals, not just any animals. Animals who have horns and hoofs, that is, that is animals that cost a whole lot of money. How can an animal that is costly be of less value to God? than the sacrifice of thanksgiving. <laughs> well, he himself set Israel straight. In Psalm 50, he spoke through the psalmist and he said, let my people know, the same people that are coming over and saying, well, we're offering so that we could receive. We're offering, and now God, you have to be our God. You have to be our protector. You have to do this. You have to do such. And he said, ah, do you not realize that sacrifices, animal sacrifices, it, it's just a sign of things to come. It is not necessarily because I need your goats and your ox and your bulls and all that. I don't need any of that stuff. It's because without the with, with without blood, there is no remission of sins. And so I'm I'm looking forward to a day when there will be the ultimate sacrifice. It, all I'm doing now is covering your sins. I'm covering them up till next year where you have to do it again because I need atonement. I need a substitute. I need to place your sin on a perfect being. But I'm looking forward to the day where the ultimate sacrifice, the Lamb of God, takes place and fulfills my what I have asked for in blood. It will be the perfect, the perfect, the blood of animals, the blood of oxen cannot take the place of the Lamb of God who was perfect and pure and took your sin and gave you his righteousness. And so that's what the sacrifices of the animals were. It was just a sign of things that were to come. But he was saying, you really, really think that the God of the universe looking down at your bull going whoo we got a good one today <laughs> angels that's a really perfect one right there that's really what's going to glorify me now so he went back and he spoke through the psalmist to let Israel know he said I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens and this is why, because every animal in the forest is mine. 
It's Psalm 50. You can read it at home at some point. He said, and the cattle on a thousand hills, that belongs to me. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. You can't sacrifice to me and make me happy over a little animal. That's not what makes me happy. That's not what I'm looking for. That is not what exalts me. Your, your praise for praise's sake is not what exalts me. I'm not looking for the act of praise necessarily. I'm looking for something that goes beyond that. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields, they're mine. And if I were hungry, he said, I wouldn't even tell you. You know why? Because the world is mine and all that is in it. The, 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 the KJV said, I'm the fullness thereof. He says, do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? He said, no. And watch this. He said, the sacrifices of God are thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Fulfill your vows to the most high. What sacrifices I'm going to accept is the sacrifices of a heart that is full of thanksgiving because when you are thankful you are admitting I am the beneficiary and you are the benefactor I am the recipient you are the giver you are admitting without you I can do nothing I can do nothing of my own I Is that not what David said? David, the, arguably the richest man in the world at that time, when he had sinned, he came before the Lord. And all he had to do, folks, was bring a sin offering to the temple. That's all he had to do. And yet he came. David was not just a psalmist and a king. Apostle Peter called him in his first sermon in Acts chapter 2 a prophet. Consider the prophet David. Watch this. David saw things way beyond his years. And David said, um, you know what? I have sinned. I messed up. But you're not looking for a sacrifice of bulls or goats or else I would have given it. He said, I'm arguably the wealthiest man in the world right now. That's what you want, man. I own all sorts of cattle. I would sacrifice not one. I would find all sorts of cattle that I can sacrifice to you. He said, that's not what you're looking for. He said, the sacrifices of the Lord are a contrite heart and a broken spirit. And that you will not despise. That is the praise. That is the sacrifice that is acceptable unto you. That is the sacrifice that you will look down on and you will accept and you will smell and you will say, ooh, child, this is what's blessing me now. What's blessing me now is that you have finally come to the conclusion that you are in my debt. That it is you that owes me your life. That it is you that if it had not been for me that who was on your side. I'm not your easy button from Staples. I'm not your mannequin. I am not, I am not your little puppet. You can't move me with your words. You can't move me with your little dances. The dance that is acceptable unto me. The praise that is acceptable. The song that is acceptable is when you come down and say, God, in order to magnify you, I I must humble myself in order that you are greater. I must be lesser so that you would be magnified. I must say, God, I owe you everything. You've been too good to me. We thank you for family. We thank you for church. We thank you for life. We thank you for every good gift and every perfect gift. It comes from above. And without you, I can do nothing.
would you lift your hands all over this building right now and offer up the sacrifice of thanksgiving that sacrifice that says God this is the acceptable sacrifice of praise I thank you I'm in your dance thank you Jesus this is gratitude this is gratitude flowing from your people we say thank you thank you this is gratitude right now when we give of our offering we give it not to get but because you've been so good who am i and what are my people that we should come with this offering to you we give you what we have received from your hand. You have given to me. You love me first. It is you. I'm thankful. Is there any thankful people in this house tonight? Is there any thankful people in this building that can say thank you, Jesus? I don't deserve what I've gotten. I don't deserve what you have given me. I don't deserve anything you have bestowed upon. I end, I end this and, uh, you know, we can all come to this altar at some point, but if you're in this house and you still don't know Jesus, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you are in God's debt. You want to know why you're in God's debt? You want to know why God will not hear your praise right now? Because you're not a friend of God. You're not a friend of God. If you have not placed your full faith in Jesus Christ, if you have not acted out that faith through repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, if you have not followed according to what the scripture said you called him Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead the Bible declares that you are an enemy of the cross the Bible said you are justified by faith and only when you're justified by your faith you have peace with God before you are just before that faith you don't have peace with God. You are at war with God. Don't think that you can come and sneak in the back and lift your hands because you have a need and maybe you're lifting your hands will bribe God into giving you what you have. God is not pleased with your praise. The only acceptable praise that God will accept here today is of those who have been redeemed, who know everything I have I owe to Him. Everything I have. Salvation is the greatest gift that has ever come to mankind. Everything I have, it belongs to you. Thank you, Jesus, because you didn't have to sacrifice yourself on that cross for me, and yet you spared not your own son, but you gave him a ransom for me. This is what, this is what we need to come before the Lord with. It's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. When you praise, when you dance, when you run the aisles, when you give to him, you don't give to him for something. You give to him because of something. Because he has already done this for you. He has already blessed you beyond measure. He has already provided for you. This altar is open all over this building. You can make your way down to this altar and say, God, here I am. I'm thankful. Thank you. I'm in awe of you. Thank you. You didn't have to do it, but thank you. Your sacrifice was for me. Everything I have, it belongs to you. Everything you've ever, you've ever bestowed upon me is because of you. I owe it to you. I am in your debt. You are benefactor. I am the beneficiary. I owe you. 